welcome to the pianist playing the organ. Uh, I have to say that I have been in this session with Fred before and it made a lot of sense to me, although I'm still terrible with the um, pedals. Um, as a native of Durham region, Fred Graham was Deer, Deer Pride Professor? Deer Park, okay. This would have been better if I'd typed it. Uh, Deer Park Professor of Music at Emmanuel College uh, and the University of Toronto from 2001 to 12. During this time, his portfolio included the roles of Director of Chapel Worship, Founding Director of Canada's First Master of Sacred Music Program, and Basic Degree Director, Dean of Students. Uh, his career encompasses both teaching and counseling. His prior experience was as officer for worship and music at the headquarters of the United Church, where he was intensely involved in preparation of two musical liturgical resources, Voices United from 1996 and Celebrate God's Presence 2000. While introducing these resources to congregations, he conducted workshops month, sorry, monthly for 14 years, oh my goodness, from Newfoundland all the way out to Vancouver Island. Fred holds the Bachelor of Music, Music Education from Toronto, the Master of Music in Organ Performance and Literature from Eastman, and PhD in Liturgical Studies from Drew University, Madison, New Jersey. His doctoral thesis related to Methodist hymns of the 18th century and was published by Scarecrow Press with Heart and Voice as in 2004. Beginning in 1978, he was music director at the Cathedral Church of All Saints in Halifax, Nova Scotia. As well as performing academic duties, Fred has always maintained his presence in the parish ministry, including several church positions in the GTA, such as Humbercrest United. Online folks. Really sorry, online folks. <laughs> St. George's United and Christ Church. Deer Park, I got that one right this time, Anglican Church, St. Clem Clement's Anglican, and most recently, St. George's Anglican in Ajax. He was granted status as a licensed lay worship leader and has preached regularly for congregations throughout Southern Ontario in recent years. He has been the recipient of several honorary awards as seen in 2011 when he received the Davidson Trust Prize for Excellence in Theological Teaching, 2014, when his peers in the world of hymnology awarded him the Fellowship of the Hymn Society in the USA and Canada. And in 2020, when the Royal Canadian College of Organists awarded the Distinguished what is that? Service Award. Thank you. The Distinguished Service Award. Upon his retirement from Emmanuel College, he was appointed Professor Emeritus by the Senate of Vietona University. Is that correct? Victoria yes. University. Victoria. Victoria. Fred is the editor and author of the revised Common Lectionary. 20th Anniversary Edition, published in 2012 by Fortress Press in the USA, and is stated uh, to present that work to a, an international forum in Ireland in August of 2023. May I come with you? Uh, in semi-retirement, he serves congregations as musician or preacher, and sometimes both, whenever requested. He and his spouse, also a retired church musician, live close to, uh, to family in North Oshawa. So uh, without any further ado, I'm gonna put the microphone down and let Fred take over. Thank you, Karen. I'm sorry that was so long. Just call me Fred, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is an auspicious meeting because uh, this chancel has a history with me. Uh, I was the interim organist here t two times in my life. Um, 
when uh, I arrived, this instrument was not here yet. And the, carp the chancel had broad loom that was that deep, from wall to wall. And when I knew that the acoustics were suffering terribly, that was even before I knew about this button, carpet bedrooms, not churches. Um, I ordered 200 of these from GIA, uh, and this is my last one, <laughs> because I've been giving them away randomly. <laughs> anyway, uh, just to bore you with this short story, um, I knew that one of the altos in the Islington Choir had just renovated her kitchen. And so one Sunday, when the choir got ready to process up the aisle, each chorister in their music folder carried one square kitchen tile. And during the opening prayer, each chorister reached down and put the tile under their feet. And when the choir stood to sing their first number, the congregation thought the Toronto Mendelssohn Choir had arrived because for the first time in history they heard the choir. Why? Because they were standing on a firm surface. So that's the history behind this anti-carpet rampage <laughs> that I'm on. I also have a clutch of uh, former preaching colleagues across the country who stand in the pulpit on plexiglass so that they too can benefit from no carpet in the pulpit. Um, it's very important when singing <clears throat> that the heel bone be connected with a hard surface because the heel bone causes the whole exoskeleton to vibrate and that is your first megaphone. People say, oh, we have a sound system. I don't care. If your voice isn't being its natural self, you will collapse from strain or people won't hear you. So that isn't the reason you came here, but that's the little sidebar bonus for the day. Um, I don't know your backgrounds. I don't know your abilities. Uh, I thank you for showing up. Um, I'm open to questions. If I, my planning hasn't gone in the direction you need, please say so. Um, I have enough experience to be reasonably flexible. Um, I have a, oh, first of all, I am currently the interim director at the Anglican Church in Ajax, Ontario. I was called on the first Sunday of October 2021. Would I come for a month or two? And 20 months later, I'm still there. Um, but the ad is open, and if you know anybody who is job hunting, I have an ad here for you to put on your church bulletin board. Um, it's a lovely position. I will. I have a sad face the day I leave, but I'm trying, trying, trying to retire. Um, and I uh, envy anybody who comes into this position. The priest is a former theater director, and she loves drama, and she uses Voices United and Common Praise equally. Uh, and this Sunday, we're not doing Anglican anything. We're having a hymn festival on the care for creation. That's how how broad the spectrum is. Um, on the handout that I'm about to pass around, um, you will see that I am willing to spend a little time at the piano, if you wish, uh, but now that we're all in the chancel, I can skip immediately to part B, which is the organ. Um, on the piano lid, Margaret? Oh, shoot. On the piano are uh, copies of uh, some of the music that I am quoting this morning uh, for you. And I want to say I've been through the whole uh, Long and McQuaid display in the room, and this, the f choice there is excellent. I recommend everything uh, <clears throat> that they have there. Um, how many of you have, uh, well, let's say five years' experience at the organ? Hands up. Okay, how many of you have two years experience at the organ? Okay, how many of you have less than that at the organ? Right, okay. All right, that helps me trim my, uh, hone my vocabulary. Um, <clears throat> and you can stop me anytime or write your question on the back page. Uh, I do want to point out to you that at the back are two books uh, down on the piano. 
and one is from the piano bench to the organ bench. It comes in several volumes, and it has really accessible repertoire and techniques for how to find your way around an organ console. Uh, the other examples are taken from those books on display, and many of them are replicated out in the display. Um, <clears throat> part B, at the organ console, when pianists are asked to act as an organist, your role, as I see it, is to accompany congregational song and to provide occasional liturgical music. That is in some places called the prelude and the postlude. I avoid those terms at all costs. I insist when I go to a church that it's called the gathering music and the leaving music because I feel that the music is part of the liturgy. It isn't prelude to anything. Um, once the first note sounds, worship is underway in my uh, definition. So the first thing we need to do if we're uh, accompanying a song is to choose stops. Uh, this organ was designed after a British model and as you see has dozens of stops. Uh, the organ is very, much bigger than the building needs. So actually, when I play here for Jason, if he's away, I use approximately 10 of these 50 stops. Um, that's one thing you always need to find out is how big is the stop you're using. The second thing is that the eight, does everybody know what eight foot tone is? So the longest pipe in the rank is eight feet long. Um, and you will find on the, on the stop right here, it says open die pays an eight. That means that is an eight foot sound. The eight foot sound replicates the human voice. It does nothing for the singer. So when I come to a church and I see um, a, a, a setting with one, two, three, four, five, eight foot sounds, that does not help your singers. Why? Because it's only replicating their vocal range. What they need to hear is a sound well above that, like a two foot. And, and this little stop, that's 24 inches long. It's up there in the chamber. That pipe is 24 inches long. So when you put that with the eight foot, can you hear? That is outside your singing range and therefore it leads you. So it is always wise to have few eight foots and lots of upper work, we call it upper work, the four foot level and the two foot level. So that the congregation hears clearly where you're going and almost and more importantly, what speed you're going. There was a little struggle last night, if you noticed in Love Divine, that there were several tempi at work in the room. And in a few minutes, I'll show you what I did to get everybody back in, <laughs> in line. All right, is there any question about choice of stops? Yeah, I have a little question. Yes. Do you want me to use the microphone? Yes, please. It's quite stuck. Thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering, you said to, um, like it's helpful to use those uh, shorter pipes um, to help singers. I find that that whenever I use those shorter pipes, the sound is so much more present. And I know that's maybe what you're looking for, but I'm wondering, is there a way around that if you're doing a hymn that's much, you know, you want a much softer tone, a much more contemplative tone, um, like, do you just still use those, but with a closed swell box? Or, or, or how would you, you know, still use those uh, higher notes and not have it be too loud? You just gave the answer. Oh, did I? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, and I'll demonstrate that. Um, I, for a boisterous hymn, I could choose eight, eight, four, and two. But if I want it more modest, I, I um, couple the swell to the great. I pull, you can't see it, but there's a stop here called swell to great. And I choose a four and a two from this manual and shut off those loud ones so that we get 
it's still there. The upper work is still there, but you've controlled it with the swell box. So you're still using your eight-foot great stops? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thanks. I have one uh, principal stop to ground the tone. Um, that is also a benefit for the 16-foot stop because it's underneath the vocal range of males or females uh, as they sing. Did I answer your question, Signa? Yes, that's right. Okay. Um, so that's about registration. Uh, I've listed for you here the diapason sound, which is bold and unique to the organ. The flute, which may be made of metal or of wood. It has a gentler, to gentler tone. It can also be used as a solo stop. The mixture is actually uh, several pipes, it's not just one. It can be a three-rank mixture or a four-rank or even a five-rank mixture. And it is reinforcing all of the very high overtones that occur, that occur in Mother Nature. The reed, um, now this organ <laughs> has reeds to spare. Um, here's the oboe. Um, whoops. Sorry, that's rather loud. So this is the oboe, which could be used as a solo stop. And um, a reed is not blowing air through an opening. It's, it's making a, you all know what a clarinet reed looks like? Well, up in the organ, it's a metal, uh, reed, um, past which the air is flowing, and, and that's what regulates the sound, which is why it's quite brassy, because it is a piece of metal. Um, on this organ you also have um, um, woods one day. Um, you have the imitation uh, um, bassoon. Um, then they have a trumpet. And then what you cannot see is the tuba over here. Um, this was really extravagant, I think, but uh, get ready for your ears to sizzle. That's an eight foot sound. Here's eight and four foot sound. Here's 8, 4, and 16 sound. All rise. <laughs> That's a real fanfare sound. Uh, I, I've played here, as you know, years of my life, and I've never used that tuba. <laughs> I was afraid it would pin people to the rear wall. <laughs> Um, mutations, those are the ones with a fraction on them. Two and two-thirds, one and one-third. Again, uh, highlighting overtones of the natural eight-foot sound, but rarely heard. And they are usually used in combination with the flute stops. Uh, later on, we'll come to um, uh, a piece that calls for a cornet, C-O-R-N-E-T. That can be built out of the stops that you have. A cornet is a five-stop sound, an eight-foot flute, a four-foot flute, a two-foot flute, a one-and-one-thirds, and a two-and-two-thirds. And it has a lovely soloistic, gentle quality to it. Um, I've already, item C on your list, I've already referred to couplers. That means that if you have a stop on the upper manual that you want to hear on the bottom manual, you couple it down. It doesn't stop you playing the upper manual, but it combines the, uh, the uh, it changes the texture of what you have available on the lower manual. Um, the next item I have there is about techniques. And you may have your own techniques uh, that help you accompany a congregation. Eight, nine, eight. So, uh, how to give the beat. Um, the hymn book is a choral book. It is not an organ book. That may shock some of you. It is up to us as organists to arrange the hymn so that it becomes an accompaniment. 
Now, obviously, you still have to play the pitches or your choir will be throw their books at you. But um, that doesn't mean that you can't, that you have to play everything legato. I was raised as a legato player, and I've had to unlearn that. So last night when we had... Um, Do you notice my hands were not on the keyboard all the time? People need to hear the drum beat. And the most important note is the down beat of each measure of music. That isn't to say you can't play legato, and certainly there were sections when there was legato playing going on. But a rest, singers will rush in to fill a rest or a silence. So when, when the tempo got all rangy last night in that, I started to play staccato. And immediately the main beat was found because I was the drummer in the midst. I'm sure the organist of Westminster Abbey would frown on that technique, but the point for me is uni unified singing. And that's why I became the drummer in that area. So that's uh, item B, legato versus detached. Um, then there come occasions when you can, um, when you may need, it's an unknown hymn, or one of our battlegrounds is the hymn you sing once a year. That could be a Christmas carol or an Easter hymn or something at Pentecost, and people say, where did you get that? Well, actually, if you count back 51 Sundays, we sang it then, um, is your answer. So you might... Um, let me get rid of some of this sound. You might need to put the solo on the lower manual and the accompaniment uh, on the upper one. I don't need, yes. So you hear very clearly uh, reminding the congregation and emboldening the melody singers. Now that doesn't do anything for your altos and tenors, but if you want people to focus on the melody, you solo it. That takes a lot of practice. You do not do this in the first four months when you play the organ. Because you have to take all the harmony parts in the left hand, and your right hand is playing only the melody. That's called soloing. Um, I mentioned in item E, duration, not touch. On the piano, it matters how you touch the key. On the organ, it doesn't. You can hit it as hard as you want. It's how long you hold the note. And that's why articulation is so important when we get to uh, organ playing. Um, is there anyone who doesn't under, understand the word piston? You all know what a piston is? Okay. Pardon? Okay, well, under the, can you, you can see under the manual here, there are buttons. They are called pistons. That means uh, I can preset the organ to whatever sound I want so that when um, you've just ended a hymn and suddenly you're going to play uh, a toccata, you need to change registration in a matter of five seconds. You have it ready on a piston. I was told by a clergy person in this city uh, not too long ago. Fred, when the blessing is over, I want sound immediately. Silence is evil. Get on it. Well, uh, so when the blessing comes and the all men, you hear the all men, you don't have a lot of time to press buttons or rearrange stops. You've got to have something at your fingers. Um, that was a position I left voluntarily. I thought that was a bit presumptuous for the clergy person to tell me when to. I was also reprimanded for playing Now Thank We All Our God on the organ because that clergy person wanted to hear it on the piano. And I thought Martin Luther would prefer the organ. So, so there. Um, we've talked a bit about registration. Um, it is influenced by many things, registration. Um, first of all, the instrument you have. Um, 
I think I'm safe in saying there's every, every instrument in the world has a stop which one would normally avoid because it may have been tuned badly or it may be out of tune. There's some of the reeds here today that are out of tune and I have to be, you will hear them uh, later on. Um, and for that you need a, a technician to come in and, and tune the pipe. Um, but even more than that, you need to be aware of music history and what instrument the co a composer had at his or her disposal. Now, uh, clever composers specify what they want as for sound. And in some of the examples that we're about to hear, you will see the registration very clearly uh, stipulated. Um, but if there's nothing at the top, the world's your oyster. And I have the good fortune to have lived and studied for many years in Germany, and I've played historic organs, so I know what... Uh, I remember playing an organ recital in North Germany a number of years ago, and the resident organist said, I never heard the organ sound that way before. And I said, well, that was because I was playing Healy Willen, and I know what his organ instrument sounded like. So I recreated the St. Mary Magdalene's organ sound. So you can shape the, the, uh, the sound according to the era of the composition. But that requires a little historical research. I was just going to say, he, what did Healy Willen use? Because I like Healy Willen. Yes. Well, um, there's, a big, uh, there's an RCCO convention in Toronto this coming July. And the opening worship will be at St. Paul's Blur Street, where Healy Willen started his Canadian career, and um, in the audience will be mem many members of the um, Oregon Historical Society. These are people who go on holidays to view uh, um, antique instruments, and they're all just dying to hear Haley Willen's instrument. So we are making sure that we are incorporating some organ voluntaries and some hymns that show off that uh, big instrument at St. Paul's Blur Street. Um, and you would need to read the specification. And it might be on the website. I haven't checked St. Paul's website. But uh, if you talk to anybody over the age of 50, they'll know what the Healy Will and Registration looked like. <laughs> I'll do, I'll refer to number two later on. I think, uh, whoops, on the, on the back side of that, I've simply listed the repertoire from which I drew today's illustrations. Um, the Oxford Service, this is item three under bibliography. Oxford Service Music for Organ, it's out there in the display. It's an excellent collection. Um, I've already referred to Feet Don't Fail Me Now which is for be people who are beginning to use their feet at the pedals. And in the same series is From the Piano Bench by Alan Hummerding, who is a current editor at World Library in the United States. When you're first transferring from the piano to the organ, of course, there is tons of material that was written for manuals only. And please don't feel shy about using manuals only. There is nothing derelict or junior or insignificant about manuals only music. Um, the organ wasn't born with a foot pedal. The organ was born with manuals and the pedals came later. So um, you'll see in a moment a piece from John Stanley. And uh, John Stanley wrote dozens of things he called voluntaries, um, which come in three or four movements. In the, from the Baroque era, of course, that was the blossoming of the pipe organ uh, in Europe. And um, you have a, the, the full organ as we know it developed in that period. So you can have principles and flutes and mixtures and mutations and reeds uh, um, to suit every piece of repertoire. French classical was a, a category that was hidden from myself for many years, and that is the music that was done in what's called alternatum praxis. 
That is, the priest would sing a line of the Mass and the organist would play the next line. So it's all liturgical. When you come to French uh, classical music, it all has a religious overtone and is the tone poem, if you want to call it that way, of a piece of the spoken liturgy. And uh, in a moment I'll play you a section from a Gloria and a section from the Magnificat. So they, they took all the principal pieces of Christian worship, the Magnificat, the Nunc Dimittis, uh, the Gloria, the Te Deum, and the Sanctus, and did a tone poem description around them. That will be largely lost on your congregation, but at least you know that it's good liturgical music. Chorale is simply uh, the word used in Germany for a hymn tune. Um, I'll share with you now that it's over. There was a little surprise for me last night for Love Divine that just as I was about to do the play over, Jason said to me, oh, there's a descant. Uh, please don't do any reharmonization. And I said, well, in Germany, no hymn book has the harmony for a hymn. All you get is the melody. And from lesson number one, you learn to harmonize the hymn tune differently in every stanza. So I just harmonized the descant. I hope it worked for those of you who were singing it. Um, so that's the word chorale, which is just hymn tune. And in a few minutes, I'll play Lo How Rose from Five Advent Improvisations. Again, it is out in the display. And Wilbur Held wrote a charming set. They're there on the piano. It's an orange cover. Uh, six carol settings. They're all easily learnable in a week of practice. Uh, I recommend them highly. Denis Bedard is the organist of the Roman Catholic Cathedral in Vancouver, and he has written uh, many very useful things. One of my standard favorites is this suite on what we call For All the Saints, the hymn tune, Sine Nomine. And uh, because it has five or six movements, you can take one of them as a prelude and a different one of the movements for a postlude, if you wish. I played his suite last night on Amazing Grace, but I left out one movement. I was chided by one of the other delegates saying, you left out the pedal solo. Well, I said it, we were late. <laughs> so I skipped one of the movements. Uh, on the piano, you will also find a book called The Essential Collection for the Church Pianist. Uh, if your church is lucky enough to have a piano, and let me say in parentheses, I would rather have a good piano than a terrible organ any time. Um, and there are a couple of other books there uh, for the piano too. I'm lucky to have a Yamaha Grand in the place where I'm working right now, and it's right beside the three manual organ. So I can switch and swap uh, as the repertoire demands. I've been talking on and on here. Any questions on something that you needed to hear about so far? All right, I'm going to put that down, and now we'll hear some actual music. Um, and I have everything preset here. I came in on Wednesday and registered the pieces ahead of time to save us time. And we start with the voluntary number eight by John Stanley. <clears throat> I've written at the top the registration of the organ that uh, John Stanley would have had at his disposal which, as you see, consists of an open diapason, a stop diapason, a principal, a twelfth, a fifteenth, and a cornet, and so on. And um, there are little markings above the right hand, and the little, the pair of, um, well, I don't know, and the equal sign on its side, that's called a slide. Now, let me just organize things here, eight, number six. So if uh, the first slide is on line two, did you hear that? That's the slide. It's just a grace note, really. 
So here's uh, my imagination is what John Stanley's instrument sounded like. So on. So he's only concerned with soft and loud. You've got a louder sound on the lower manual and a softer on the upper. Is that rocket science or is that that's straightforward? Yes, I think so. Okay. Uh, the next one that you find is the dialogue. This is a, one of the lines of the Magnificat. It's by a French composer called Guillain, Jean Adam Guillain. And um, he would have had um, no pedal board. He would have had mushrooms, uh, buttons, on the console because the pedals were very seldom used in French literature like this. Um, so what I have here is going to be coupled to the pedal because uh, you see the very first note is a pedal note. But it, it doesn't have a 16-foot stop because the instrument for Guillain would not have had a 16-foot pedal stop. And um, on line four, you see the marking, it's a different manual uh, for the cornet. And that's what I described for you. Uh, I'll, I will construct one for you. Here's the eight-foot flute, four-foot flute, two-foot flute, two and two-thirds, one and one-third. So it's less, less piercing than a trumpet would be, but it's still clear, clear because of the higher notes. So when we get to line four, the registration has to change to be... And again, it's about change of texture, not about expression. Uh, there were no swell pedals either. So it isn't about soft and loud and controlling that. It's about blocks of sound that are texturally different. So here's what the opening of um, the Magnificat would sound like. You just heard me break up that last chord. That's a harpsichord technique because all of these people composed their stuff at the harpsichord and then just took it to the organ. Um, on line one, two, three, four, the first chord is played. And you might say, well, where'd you get all those notes? And any time they had a long held third, they glossed between the 
third and the fifth of the chord. I added, it isn't, it's, you heard the little gloss in the upper voice. So lots of, and, and that isn't written anywhere. You just know that from the performance technique commentaries that exist from the age. So French classical repertoire requires some research and exposure to the style. Uh, I'm turning now over the page to the Couperin. Uh, he has uh, two, it's on the piano there. There are two masses, one for the convent and one for the parish church. And this is the offertoire. Uh, yes. Can I ask a question? Yes. Oh, sorry. You're just out of my line of sight, Margaret, so I apologize. That's okay. Um, on the third line? Yes. In the left hand? Yes. In the third bar, you, there are two eighth notes, but you didn't play them as straight eighth notes. Sorry, in the third line? Yep. Third bar? Third bar. Yes. The last two no eighth notes? Yes, did I dot them? No, you, you played them not in tempo. You went da, da, da. Right, because I, uh, I did that on purpose because I was setting up a dissonance. It was okay. just a pullback was to create tension. Oh, okay. That's an interpretation thing. They okay. could be played regularly. Okay. I just decided to be fancy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and since we stopped anyways, I was just wondering, at the start, you are playing that with the pedal? For the this is the gila? Yeah, the same piece, yes. You start with the pedal for the first two lines, is that right? Yes, I didn't need to because my left hand is free. Gotcha. It was a matter of convenience. The, okay. You notice PED is in brackets. Mm -hmm. That means the editor put that in, not the author. Okay, if I were to want to play this and use the pedal when it's suggesting it, would you, were you saying you're using eight foot stops from the grate coupled down to the yes. pedal so that when you use the manual it sounds the same? Precisely. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Did everybody understand that? So there, there really is no pedal division figuring in this. The pedal is just a convenience. In line two, measure two, my left hand is going to be very busy. I do not want to be holding that D while playing a descending uh, scale like that. Um, after all, organists are inventive. Uh, other questions? Thank you, those were all very valuable. Now we're over to the Couperin Offertoire. And again, it's blocks of sound. We have the positif for the first few measures, and then the grand clavier, which is the great, um, for, and they go al alternating like this. So. Notice also that I lifted my hands at the end of every measure. Um, organists of this period only use those fingers. It is, on, it is on record that they'd never used their thumb, except when playing a chord. But for a scalar passage, they only use these. So it is a wonderful release to be able to just pick up your hand and plunk it down in the next measure. Go for it. Um, it, it, it gives you so much more energy and uh, finger capacity. I highly recommend it. Questions about that one? Now we come up into the 20th century, Lohauer Rose. Um, I see nine, I have to change. So we have the uh, Lohau Rose tune on the left hand on manual number one. And Mr. Burkhart tells us exactly what stops he wants in the box at the upper left.
So what's going on? He has combined what? Okama, Okama Emmanuel, and Loha Rose. Isn't that clever? Then you don't have this music, but he completes the uh, Loha Rose. Is that pedal hard? I think not. <laughs> you can find it ahead of time and have your foot ready. <laughs> That's why I chose that piece. Um, I'm flipping over now to a Little Town of Bethlehem by Wilbur Held. Um, it just says choir soft stops. So uh, you're left to your own imagination. Um, now look at this pedal line. We have F, 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 oh yes, F, 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 C, ooh, F, 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 F. So with a little bit of practice, with your left hand and your pedal, you should be able to accommodate this. A tune I hope you all recognize. There are two tunes to this familiar carol. Um, even if your congregation sings the other one called St. Louis, uh, you can have this as the offertory piece or the um, prelude to the service. I'm flipping over now to Jean Ejulic by uh, Bedard. Again, uh, he provides an outline of exactly what he wants in terms of sound. Uh, I chose this because the pedal part, again, is relatively straightforward without many histrionics on the uh, pedal board. Oh, sorry. So again, you have the solo outstanding and the quiet accompaniment. Uh, and from there on, that piece is also on the top of the grand piano. Uh, minimal pe pedal preparation, and the left hand is very repetitive. Now we're on to some Baroque literature, Johann Christoph Bach. Um, again, no guidance whatsoever. But in this case, you have to understand what the German chorale is saying. And for that, you need to do a Google Translate on your computer. Mit Frieden, Freude, ich fahre dahin is the first line of Simeon's song when presented with the Christ child. Um, Lord, let us now thy servant depart in peace, for I have seen your salvation. So this is, this is a, a text of a hymn with a smile. Ah! I have finally seen the Christ child. So it's, it's not ebullient, but it can be uh, for, forceful. And this is what I chose from this organ for this piece to sound. So I chose to put my pet foot down on the A because I want my hands free to play the eighth notes upstairs. 
I did not use the pedal at the end of line one, however. So that's very straightforward. It's a very short piece. It w if your hymn comes to an end and you need something to extend the taking up of the collection, uh, that would be a suitable piece for that. The piece on the flip side of that is Jesu meine Freude. Um, and you really have to read the German um, texts of this um, to understand that although the first line is Jesu, my heart is joyful, about verse 5 it says, all the monsters are attacking me and the dragons are snapping at me and the evil things are raining lightning and thunder on me. And this piece reflects the tone poem interpretation of that text, not the ah Jesus stuff, but the, the emotional reaction to the assault of the world on the worshiper. So um, for this, I chose something bolder. Again, there's no indication for pedal, but it's coupled down in case my hands won't stretch that far. And I happen to have a size 7 glove. I have a very small hand, especially for a male, uh, so I use the pedal to escape from that trap. But look at the last line of this piece and how dramatic it is. Uh, that's very unusual uh, Baroque literature, but it's entirely descriptive. And um, the silences count, as someone was saying earlier today. Okay, those are the only prepared examples that I have for you, uh, but I'm now open to questions. And um, I think we're up at our time, but everything has run late today, so I'm taking the privilege of running late. Observations? Yes. Cliff. I was just wondering, uh, so my, my grandfather, his, his church, uh, he was a minister at, has an organ that has three manuals. And I know that sometimes that there can be even more, and I was just kind of interested. Uh, I'm sure it's probably straightforward. It's just more voices, but what, uh, yeah, why, why are there more than to you sometimes and what are, because I don't, yeah. Why are there more than, why is there more than one manual on an organ? I mean, a piano has one keyboard, right? Uh, the organ is, uh, as history went along and technology got better, they added in, they added manuals for the sound that is um, associated with that manual. Um, now in France and Quebec, it's a different matter, but I'll talk about here. This is the grate, which has all the sounds which are peculiar today for the organ. The swell has the orchestra, the oboe, the clarinet, the trumpet, uh, the flutes, so that you, and they're all under expression. They're all in a box with a, a Venetian blind on the front. So they're under, you can control the loudness. The grate, you cannot normally control the amount. Now, I tell a lie because on this organ, the grate is also enclosed. So you have to be careful what, what pedal you are pressing at this instrument. Um, if there's a third manual, it's usually the, at the bottom. It's called the choir. And it was formerly called the chair organ because it was right behind the organist's bench next to the congregation. And it has very delicate stops, as a rule, for accompanying a soloist or giving the note to the priest or whatever. Um, 
The biggest organ in the world is, I think I'm correct in saying, Atlantic City, New Jersey, has seven manuals. I've never played such a large instrument. Uh, if you go downtown to Timothy Eaton, they have five manuals. And each manual has uh, a sonic character. So the trumpet that you find on the fifth manual, you will not find on the grade. It's a, it's a different... Um, a different loudness, a different timbre, it's, it's voiced differently. And the, uh, some churches you will go to have an organ in the rear gallery, like St. Paul's Blue Street. And my teacher used to get me to play a piece on the organ and then I'd lift my hands and hear the whole thing play back at me. <laughs> um, and that's usually called a, a solo division because you're, you're um, encouraging people 500 feet away from you to get in time with the music. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Yes? Um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about coupling with the pedals. Yes. Uh, because, like, I've played a piece recently where the solo was entirely on the pedals because it moved nice and slowly and the hands were busy being the accompaniment, which is really nice. And you talked a bit already about if it's a manuals only piece, more or less, but you can use the pedals, so you just couple the great stops down. Yes. Uh, but, like, sometimes uh, I wonder, like, do you ever couple the other rank or the other manual stops to the pedal just for more sound? Or, like, because I know you can run into the issue where then you're playing a pipe with your feet that you don't want to be playing in the line with your hand because it's they're using the same pipe. So I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about things to look out for when coupling to the pedals. Or if I'm crazy, I don't know, no, really know what I'm talking about. You're not crazy. I am trying to uh, get the fine point of your question. Um, nor when you're play, doing a plenum, a ple, um, plenum P -L -E -U -M, um, you want the manuals and the pedal to be equally strong. So automatically I couple down. Um, if I want the solo to be on the lower manual and the accompaniment on the upper manual, I will not couple the lower manual to the pedal because that will interfere. I think that's perhaps what you're referring to. So you have to be careful when coupling that you're getting the sonic result that you really want. It's all about balance. Um, there are certainly sounds in the manual that are not available in the organ. Uh, uh, sorry. There are sounds on the manuals that are not available in the pedal registration. Um, sometimes a piece has eight foot for the hands and four foot for the pedal, which puts it an octave above what your hands are doing. And that's fine too. But in case you couple nothing, choose a four foot stop on the pedal division. Okay. That help? Okay. Other questions? I'm sorry I can't hear you all play. Yes, another question from Cliff. The little knobs or buttons down by, by the pedals. Well, they are, um, sometimes your hands are so busy that you must do it with your feet. And when a registration change comes in the middle of a line, you've got to, f flash, you've got to lash out with your right foot and kick a button. Um, I'll see if I can... Um, so, I'm going to take everything off. If I press this, you'll see stops pop out. Okay. They're also... You can't see them here, but they're couplers. It says swell to great. When I press it there, I can't always reach over here and yank. Um, I'll tell you a story. I was playing at St. Mary Queen of the World in Montreal a few years ago, and I, everything was going very well. Everybody was singing, and I thought, oh, I'll add a, a stop. And I pulled it, and it came right out in my hand. <laughs> Fortunately, I had a page turner, and I just said, Peter, take this. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I was too startled to register what was going on. <laughs> Um, so, uh, may the saints preserve you from that. <laughs>
Well, it's lovely to meet you all. And uh, if other things occur to you in the course of the afternoon, don't hesitate to come and speak. But, uh, thank you for your attention. And, uh, Feel free to per peruse the display on the piano.